So did you have any questions about that last section when we were doing the very short chin resig practice with the five colored not light coming down? <clears throat> or um, about the last yoga with signs meditations or the yoga without sign? I think what it reminded me of was just the joy of simplicity, you know, just the, the pared down words. Um, you know, I, I do wonder if you, you might have any suggestions for a, a fairly literal non-poetic person on how to kind of work with elaborations and masses of offerings and, you know, just how in some of the commentaries, you know, Tara, kind of purified 100,000 people in, in one click of the finger or whatever. You know, this kind of, I, I really appreciate that perhaps they're metaphors, but they can, for, for me personally, sometimes feel um, over elaborate and exaggerated. So yeah, any suggestions, welcome. Yeah, I mean, I, I always feel like elaboration in Buddhism is, to help us come back to the simple and the simple invites elaboration and that it's like somehow an invitation for flexibility. You know, so it's kind of like when you were four years old, it occurred to you that love is a good thing, <laughs> you know, or like your grandmother taught you love is important. And you're like, yeah, it is, you know, and now everything is just variations on a theme and that those deep knowings you had as a child are not significantly different than the deep knowings you have as an adult, but you need more information to anchor them and to deepen them and to make them richer. But you're coming back to the same conclusion as when you were a little kid, which is, we cannot survive without love. May there be love in me. May I give love out of me. May I receive it. May I give it. The whole point of it is this. That I know. But now I need to understand what stands in opposition to it. Okay, attachment, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these millions of things that part of us kind of knew before they were trapped into lists and definitions and words, we already kind of knew viscerally or intuitively or from past lives or whatever, we knew it already. But to anchor it in words and to have a systematized process to really challenge ourselves about what blocks the heart and to invite ourselves to open it wider, it enriches it. And then, and then you kind of let go of the elaboration for a while and just come back to simple truths I've always known. And then for a while, simple truths you've always known can get a little stale or like lose some flexibility or get kind of flavors of complacency or something and then you need to open it back up again and elaborate again and get lists and definitions and stories and poetry and images and kind of burst it back into life again and then return to the simplicity with richness again so i somehow feel like our practice is like that where it goes simple and huge and simple and huge and that you're not doing anything radically different than you've ever done. You're just finding more ways to reinforce those basic truths. So these stories, I feel like for some people, you know, uh, I don't know, allegory or analogies or metaphors or poetry or stories convey some sort of richness in the point of them, not the actual story of them. The point of them conveys something very important. Like did Chen Rezig really, make a promise that if he lost his bodhicitta, he'd break into a thousand pieces if he ever lost his bodhicitta. And then the demon said, give me your arm. And Chen Rezig said, sure, and handed him his arm. And then the demon said, you handed it to me with your left arm. That is so rude. And Chen Rezig was like, oh my God, sentient beings are impossible. Lost his bodhicitta, burst into a thousand pieces. Did that happen? I don't care, <laughs> right? Like I kind of, I don't care if it happened or not. It conveys something very important to me about my daily life and my expectations and how conditional I can be and how much I expect appreciation or applause for doing the right thing. I don't want to get lost in whether it's true or not. I want to get to the, what's the point of it. Do you know what I mean? And so some people do take them very literally and it makes them very happy to do so. And some people think that is impossible. Why would I even listen to it? 
and they miss the magic of whatever is woven within it. And so I feel like somehow we need to strike some sort of resonance of regardless, what's the point? In terms of the study, you know, I think that sometimes it can get a little dry and you think, must we split so many hairs? Must we? <laughs> right? And I think that the answer is sometimes, not always. You know, it, it feels like the same lesson keeps coming back to us again and again, which is how to stay in that flow state of not too tight, not too loose. What's going to keep pacing and momentum and energy and vitality? And sometimes it's staying very simple and sometimes it's bringing in elaboration. And it really doesn't even matter which it is. It, the question is, am I staying in that flow and that momentum with my practice or am I getting stagnated? I don't, wanna, I don't want it to ever sound like pressure, like you need to remember all of these things. It's more like an invitation for a uh, inner conversation what do these lists make me think of or what references do I make or how do I bring them home to myself? And when you have that really relaxed, happy mind about it, of course you wind up remembering tons. And when you have a tight mind that says, oh no, a list, another list, I must remember, then of course you forget everything, you know? So it's, it's just keep a really curious, happy mind of, huh, that's huh, interesting. <laughs> I, I think when, when, um, from Wendy's comment, I, I think I'm the other way. I want more elaboration. I kind of really, really want more detail and elaboration. <laughs> and, uh, and simplicity is, is great, but I, I just think I want more, I want more of this, <laughs> far more detail. <laughs> well, it's a good reflection because, you know, that's, we need different things at different points in our practice, you know? And I, uh, it's like neither is good or bad in and of themselves. The question is what's keeping you sparky, you know, and inspired and uplifted. Yeah. And yeah. so it's really just that like deep self-awareness and there is no transformation without self-awareness is there. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's what it all boils down to. Our practice is inner work, our inner world, our inner conversation. So if you don't know how you're responding to practice or information, then how can it possibly integrate? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it made me think a bit about um, Mahamudra teachings and sort of, you know, arising, abiding and ceasing. And for me, that's something that's helpful because um, I can have a tendency to sort of get a bit tight. Um, so for me, that's helpful. And I also really appreciate what you said yesterday about teachers of Tantra tending to either be quite experiential or tending to go with, you know, like full tenets and whatnot. And I think I found it a bit difficult finding a way around and sort of through that really. But um, no, I, I found that really helpful, you know, as you said about the energy and the vitality. Um, and with that particular practice, or well, there's a number of practice where there's a sort of like Dhyani Buddhas and rainbow light. I just sort of see it as like this sort of flowing rainbow light and then coming in and through and then just sort of see it as coming through and going out. And so for me, it works to keep it reasonably simple, usually. Um, and I don't know, from my limited experience of Sadan as the different ones I've done, it sort of feels like they're all reflecting of each other and the components yeah. are pretty similar um so yeah hmm. i mean it, it's sometimes like if if suddenly i don't know we had we were thrust into a classroom and we had to be the substitute teacher for a bunch of teenagers okay so say we were suddenly thrust into the classroom we're the substitute teacher none of the kids know us um and we're kind of put on the spot okay and that's kind of like what you would be bringing is all of your life skills, all of your life experience to be able to address the needs of various students. So some kids would need you to be cool and upbeat and flexible and jokey. And some of the kids would need you to be firm and decisive and disciplined in a gentle way, right? And some of them would need you to speak softly and slowly and gently. And it doesn't mean that you're three different people those are just three different capabilities you can bring forth given the needs of various children. 
And because we're adults and we've lived in the world and we were children once ourselves, we have an idea about what would work for different dispositions. So I always imagine that the Buddhas are like an amazingly elevated version of that where they can be anything, but they're choosing different aspects to suit our minds. You know, and that the, the guru, for example, is choosing different dispositions to suit our minds. Like my own teacher, for some people, he is very blunt and brusque and makes fun of them and teases them and they love it. It bounces right off of them. And for others, he's like sweet grandpa and he's like, oh, you're very smart, you know, right? And he's just totally cuddly bear grandpa aspect. And for others, he roars at them, you know, and for all of us, it feels like love. But if he took one aspect and put it in a different person, it wouldn't resonate the right way. So a lot of this development and this flexibility and being and doing different practices, I feel like is just getting all of these tools in our developmental tool belt so that we can really meet people with strategies that work for them. Because it's just like some days we want simplicity, some days we want elaboration. That's important knowledge for us. What do others need from me, from what I'm able to give them today in this moment? What's going to bring out the Chen Resigness in them? You know, and so you're listening deeply for other people's wisdom and asking yourself, how can I meet their wisdom in such a way that it invites it even further out? You know, and your Chen Rezig speaks to their Chen Rezig and it becomes a Chen Rezig extravaganza. Right? So, so it's like kind of take what you already know about life and then the Dharma is elevating and deepening or expanding, however you want to picture it. It was a question about um, bringing in your own creativity to these visualizations. Um, we can make, you know, uh, my mind tends to add or subtract, um, divide, <laughs> multiply, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I mean, so that's okay to do, obviously, right? I mean, that's what you basically what you're saying, because even as one individual, we can change how we feel from. And, and, and what we need in from one day to the next. Um, yeah. I, I think that what we have to remember is how hard it is to have any kind of discipline, but the power of continuity. So how do you marry up? I need to be flexible and adjust to my energy level day to day while keeping a continuous thread while not reinventing the wheel, right? So you have mm -hmm. kind of like, the basic structure of your practice mm -hmm. and, and there's the points that you always hit right refuge bodhicitta essential cannot give up you cannot uh, skip that part right refuge bodhicitta you know and then other parts okay offerings i don't have to do the giant offerings but i need to at least do a offering at that point you know so you're making sure you're hitting all the main points but on days that you're tired or you need more simplicity you do it more simply days that you've got more spaciousness and expansiveness you do it more detailed but every day you're doing that practice so it's that delicate dance of making it your own without reinventing the wheel being disciplined but still being really flexible and it's not like you're being disciplined because you're like a bad girl who should be punished it's you're being disciplined because there is power in repetition so you give yourself the best chance for success with repetition. And nobody is watching except the Buddhas who love you regardless. But what you're trying to do is, is just keep the power of continuity because otherwise what winds up happening is we'll do a big burst of practice and then nothing. And then a big burst and then nothing. And those big bursts are meaningful and they do help us, but they start to become akin to kind of peak experiences in life that we don't pull into the rest of our life. And then we kind of miss the momentum that we could use from them. You know, so you have a big intensive something, a group retreat or a llama visit or whatever. Then you ask yourself at the end of those days, how do I pull a thread of that into my daily life? In the simplest you know, most personal of ways, but to not lose the fact that you were lifted a bit more by those events.
Um, I'd just like to ask you about the, the booklets and the sadhana um, and how you move from the booklet possibly to the proper meditation because I read the sadhana and then I feel I'm not doing the meditation mm. and then sometimes then I'll think well I'll do it without and I do refuge in everything and then I get to a panic almost it's like <laughs> where's the book I can't do it or how how would you advise us to use the book there you know there's a lot of benefit to memorizing your sadhanas but I think that I wouldn't make it a special plan to memorize it. I think with a relaxed mind, you memorize much more easily anyway. What, what I wind up doing is if it's a new practice, you know, like I've just gotten a new empowerment and I have a new sadhana that I'm getting used to. I just do it as written for a few days until I'm used to the words. And then I start consciously pressing pause you know, even though it's a text, it's not a recording, right? But like mm -hmm. I get to an obvious section transition and I just stop and I say, okay, I'm gonna meditate for three minutes on refuge. Meditate for three minutes on refuge. Finish. Okay, four immeasurable thoughts. I can do some tone line at the end of four immeasurable thoughts. So I'm gonna do that. Okay, four immeasurable thoughts, pause, tone line. Yeah, and then, you know, you, you just sort of are consciously choosing natural transitions to pause and give depth and time. And it works to, you know, kind of look at your sadhana and, and think about it ahead of time, particularly to marry it up with any commentary you might have had. Yeah, and just kind of um, say we're doing that practice we just did. It might be that when you're visualizing the body of Chenrezig above the crown of your head, you take a minute to really spend time, what's called minding the symbolism, and you think, okay, so he's got four arms. They represent the four immeasurable thoughts. The jewel represents compassion. The mala beads recite the mantra. The lotus represents wisdom. The three principal aspects of the past are the lotus sun and moon that he sits on, blah, 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 right? And you're just kind of like remembering everything you know about the symbolism of Chenrezig while holding the image. And then just stay with the image without analysis and see if it's a bit brighter or clearer. Doesn't matter if it is or isn't, just try gently. And then add the nectar flowing down. You know, so it's just conscious pauses to give it more, more connection. Thank you. That's Does that helpful. help? Is that your question? Yes, it is. And I think that's very helpful. Thank you very much. On that, on that note, Claire, this is what I sometimes do, and I hope it's not a bad thing. Um, when I've bought... <laughs> Yeah, from the FPMT, I print it out and then I get a big A4 book and I cut out the first section and paste it on top. And then underneath I write things that I've heard in commentaries, which obviously are so much more vivid when you hear the words from a human in their in in your own cultural context or kind of weaving in. Um, and I stick that underneath. Um, and then sometimes I leave a few pages because I love reading commentaries as well. So then I might stick in the right bit from the commentary, but it actually very quickly gets too full up because I love reading commentaries. Um, so in general, I just write a kind of praise of the most vivid words that I've heard or what I'm meant to be doing. Um, and then I paste in the next bit. So I've got refuge and I'll write down whatever I've heard about that but quite short, otherwise it gets way too long. And then turn the page and maybe on the next right-hand page, put the bodhicitta thing and so on and so forth. So I hope it's not terrible to be cutting up Dharma things, but I think my intention probably overrides any um, accidental. Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah, no, it's a great idea. It's a great idea. And, you know, little scribbled notes in the margin, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to really be active with your practice. Yeah, active engagement with your practice, not kind of passive. Sometimes, um, sometimes in group practices, it depends on your leader, but you'll just read the sadhana like at rocket speed, just like rabbiting through it, like to get through it or like to get to the mantra or something. And sometimes that's just necessary because of the timetable or it's because the emphasis of the retreat is on the mantra accumulation but it doesn't mean you have to do it that way slow down you know and just give it connection time 
And then some parts, it might be you can read them quite quickly because they're so familiar that you connect because of familiarity. You know, so it's not like there's a benefit or disadvantage in slowness or fastness in and of itself. It's about personalizing it. And then when you're in group practice, there is so many correct ways that you say right now in group practice, now I'm shifting gears to benefiting from the group energy. And I'm going to go the speed of the chant leader and the tune of the chant leader. And it doesn't matter if the chant leader does it differently than the way I do it. Right now, the practice is about using the group energy and the community connection. So you kind of shift gears very consciously than when you're in that group space and you get something different. You get a new nuance from it, doing it in that way. So sometimes that can be uh, jolting if you've been doing a practice a, a long time and then you're in a group and they do it differently to how you learned it. But it's again, keeping that mind that is just really flexible and creative as well as collaborative and just kind of like goes with it and sees what happens, like really open and curious. There's kind of two modalities, group practice and solo practice. But solo practice, please make it your own in terms of speed and depth and weaving in commentaries and all that kind of stuff. And, and even making notes of, I always get stuck on this line. I must ask my teacher about this line, you know, or ask the senior students if they know a good commentary on it. You know, really be proactive with your practice. Okay, so five Buddha families. Um, five Buddha families is a very interesting concept, which we're of course not going to cover just in one session. But um, when we're looking at these, you're going to start noticing them more and more if you've not had this teaching before, the way they're woven into everything in Tibetan Buddhism, the five colors, the five Buddha families, the five aggregates, the five wisdoms, five, 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 everywhere. And it's it's a way of understanding the tantric worldview, which is that everything that is difficult about your own mind is also the very thing you can use for wisdom. So it's not that you change an affliction into a wisdom, that doesn't work. But what you do is you take the energy that accompanies an affliction and then bring a positive state of mind to it. So what we're normally doing in the sutra tradition is say you're working on your anger, okay? What are the antidotes to anger? Patience, loving kindness, the wisdom realizing emptiness, or meditating on the breath or walking meditation to diffuse, right? Classics. So what those do is they kind of like punch a hole in the anger or interrupt the momentum of the anger or take the fuel of the anger away so that you settle. Yeah, or prevents you from getting angry in the first place. And then when you are angry, your analysis kicks in and reminds you, don't say anything, <laughs> right? And then you settle down and then you do a proper analysis, whatever. Or if you're too angry to do any kind of analysis because your anger will co-opt your analysis, you walk or you do breathing meditation or something like that till it settles. Practical, straightforward, settling and soothing. In the Tantra path, what you're doing is you're saying, okay, there's a huge amount of energy in anger. And sometimes the affect or the appearance of anger can be a useful tool to kind of spark passion, to protect, to correct injustice, et cetera, et cetera. But the wish to harm, ill will, is always negative. The wish to harm is always negative, but the appearance of fierceness can be useful. I need to separate the two, yeah? But still use that powerful energy to know what needs to be done. Okay, so how do I look at that differently? I remember emptiness, yeah. And you're kind of also looking at what are the positive elements of something like anger that often get co-opted by anger into something negative. So like analysis, for example, when you're angry, you have a lot to say to yourself about why you're right and they're wrong and the whole story and everything it reminds you of and how people are crap, right? You have a lot to say to yourself. Now, what you're saying to yourself in that context is not useful, but your ability to do so is. So you're changing the content and you're saying, how about this analytical ability become sharpened and refined and married up to something like compassion? 
So anyway, so we'll walk through it, but just kind of looking at how all of our negative states of mind can have a parallel positive state of mind that can be developed and knowing what your classic problematic behaviors are can actually help open you up to what your greatest strengths might be. And that all tantric practices encompass and embody all of these five Buddha families, but they'll emphasize one in particular, which can sometimes mean when you're doing that practice, that affliction can arise more easily when you're distracted. But it also means that that wisdom can start growing a lot more specifically in a more emphasized way. So it's an interesting thing to start looking at. It's kind of like a personality type theory or something like that in psychology, but a lot deeper. Okay, so this is from uh, Lama Yeshi. He says, meditation on the five Buddhas or conquerors is visualized in tantric practice to purify the five aggregates or skandhas and to transform the five defilements of greed, hatred, self-importance, jealousy, and ignorance into the five wisdoms. So purifying them into, not transforming them into. The five aggregates are form, feeling, recognition, compositional factors, and consciousness. The five wisdoms are voidness, equality, individuality, accomplishment, and mirror-like wisdom. So there's some term variation here, and this is an old translation. So sometimes you'll hear defilements ca called um, disturbing emotions. And um, the aggregates or skandhas um, and wisdoms, these are sometimes getting slightly different names, like uh, the aggregate of recognition is sometimes called discernment. Um, and some of the five wisdoms have different names that are similar as well. But just to kind of get your head around the basic idea, then um, here's the heads of them, okay? <laughs> the heads. <clears throat> so we break them down into Akshobhya, Virachana, Ratnasambhava, Amitabha, and Amoga City. And when we're looking at the mandala, <clears throat> excuse me, on its own, here's the positions they go in. But in the mandalas of the deities that you're practicing, they're going to change around. And the one in the center is going to be the one that's emphasized. So it's not going to be that literally the five Buddhas are going to show up in every mandala, but the colors of the five Buddhas are. So the names of these families, Bhadra family, Tathagata or Buddha family, Jewel family, Lotus family, and Karma family or action family. Their respective directions and syllables, Yuhum and East, Om and Center, Tram and South, Pri and West, Ah and North. So if you're remembering the Nungne Sadhana, when there's the bath offering, there's that little mirror and the umze draws a little grid and does some dots. They go om, hum, tram, hri, ah. Basically they're saying all the Buddhas are here on this mirror that I place in the bath and then offer water to. And that's what they look like in Tibetan. And so here they are and they each have thrones and there are specific animals under each throne. And so under the yellow Buddha, Ratnasambhava, are horses representing loyalty is emphasized. Under Akshobhya, the blue one, we have elephants representing strength. Virachana, the white one, is sitting on lions representing courage. The red one, Amitabha, he's sitting on peacocks representing knowledge. And Amoga City is sitting on Garudas, representing protection. So you'll see these, and sometimes you'll see these animals um, around the base of various stupas, and the meaning is usually the same. There's a little bit of variation. And then you'll see these hand implements, right? Everywhere in Buddhism, you're seeing these various symbols or hand implements. Sometimes in empowerments, you'll see them like on a plate as little statues. Sometimes you'll see them on uh, banners that are hanging. And they're again, representing the five Buddha families. So you have Ratnasambhava has a jewel or a norbu. Akshobhya has a dorje or a vajra. Virachana has a dharma chakra or a dharma wheel. 
Amitabha has a lotus or a pema, and Amoga City has a double dorje, although sometimes he has a sword. So in early Mahayana iconography, only a few main mudras or hand gestures were depicted upon sculpted Buddha images. And these became the distinguishing gestures of the five Buddhas in later Vajrayana iconography. So the enlightenment or teaching mudra was assigned to Virachana, the earth touching mudra to Akshobhya, the boon granting mudra to Ratnasambhava, the meditation mudra to Amitabha, and the protection mudra to Amoga City. So if you're looking at these Buddhas and they're all gold, because they're all just statues that haven't been painted, you can't see their colors, you might be able to distinguish them by um, what their hands are doing. So Virachana teaching mudra, Akshobhya earth touching mudra, Amitabha meditation mudra, Ratnasambhava boon granting or generosity mudra, and Amoga City protection, refuge, or fearlessness mudra. And you'll recognize some of these hand gestures in a lot of the other Buddhas as well. So it's kind of nice to learn these mudras. So more importantly um, are the five wisdoms. This is the main core of this teaching. And these five wisdoms are the basic energies in their purified form relating to the five aggregates and the five, quote, dhyani buddhas. So they are mirror-like wisdom corresponding to Virachana, the wisdom of analysis or discernment to Amitabha, equality to Ratnasambhava, achieving or swift activities in Ogasiddhi, Dharmadhatu wisdom to Akshobhya, and very important to realize is that these two are often swapped. So for whatever reason, the characteristics of Virachana and the characteristics of Akshobhya are switched in some traditions. So in our tradition, usually Akshobhya is related to mirror-like wisdom. Virachana is related to Dharmadhatu wisdom. It, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. I think it's important to just understand what these wisdoms correspond to in terms of their kind of distorted state. So when they're in their distorted or afflicted energy state, what are they like? And then what are they like in the flip side? So this is where it boils down to, do you ever feel that your best qualities and your worst behaviors are like two sides of the same trait? It's just something to sit with. Or maybe it's easier to see in other people that the things that you love about people and appreciate about them are also somehow related to the most aggravating aspects. <laughs> so he says the Buddha families refer to factors of Buddha nature. In other words, they are Buddha family traits. They are inborn factors of everyone's mental continuum that allow each of us to become Buddhas. So on the basis level, they are unpurified, which means that their continuities are mixed with unawareness or ignorance and the disturbing emotions and attitudes. More specifically, they're mixed with the emotional and cognitive obscurations. So this is kind of where we're at with them, but not where we have to be. On the pathway level, they are partially purified and partially unpurified. So this refers to the Arya level when some of the obscurations have been removed forever. So Aryas are people who have realized emptiness directly. And then on the resultant level, they are purified. So they function unimpededly as the enlightening aspects of a Buddha. Okay, so as we do these, just really think personally what it's like for you. So mirror-like wisdom of Akshobhya. This is the mind devoid of dualistic thought, like a mirror and its reflections. And it's associated with the element of water and it purifies anger. So think about water elementally. Water can be boiling, it can be cloudy, or it can be completely clear and still. So water is just water, right? Water is not good or bad in and of itself. When it's a flood, it's destructive. When it's a clear stream, it gives us nourishment and life. 
So water is just water. So think about your energetic quality of water and kind of bring to it this idea of water being like anger and water being like mirror like wisdom. Okay. So when you're angry and you're boiling mad, all the little bubbles of the boiling reflect things. They reflect the world, but in a very distorted way, in a broken up way. When your mind is still and calm and free from anger, it reflects things a lot more clearly, a lot more accurately. There's a lot more space and stillness to assess things. So when you're thinking about how do I work with this energy in daily life, you notice both sides of the coin. You notice that when this elemental quality of water is disturbed, it's not accurate. And when you remember that, it helps you to not believe in your anger. You stop believing what anger tells you. And then when you're calm and you're settled and you're feeling that stillness return to you, you know that what you're reflecting or what you're observing is closer to truth, at least relative truth. And so you trust yourself when you're calmer. And that kind of self-awareness of knowing when are you in your more distorted, afflicted side, and when are you in your more evolved side, helps you make decisions in real time that are a lot closer to virtue. Yeah. So then we have Amitabha, the wisdom of analysis. And some alternative translations are the wisdom of discernment or the wisdom of individuality. They all mean the same thing, but the wisdom of analysis is related to Amitabha. So this perceives the uniqueness of every phenomena. It, all the specifics, all the details, it discerns between this and that. And its associated element is fire and it purifies attachment. So think about fire. Fire can either be the thing that makes things warm and bright and cozy, or it can be the thing that destroys and consumes and is never satisfied, right? Like a forest fire just blazes through and anywhere it finds fuel, it will eat and destroy it. So when it's in its afflicted side, attachment is like fire because it's always hungry, it's never enough, and it's incredibly destructive. Think about how your own attachment is. It's like it objectifies everything you perceive as giving you happiness or contentment, whether it's people or situations or objects or food or whatever it is, your attachment says, feed me. And then when you are fed by the person, the place, the situation, the whatever, it's not enough because fire will never be satisfied. It keeps eating and keeps eating and keeps eating. So attachment is like fire and it just burns through relationships, burns through resources, makes us kind of uh, deprived of the feeling of abundance. But then the other side of that is often people with a lot of attachment the flip side is that in a good space, in a stable space, they're so warm. Yeah, there's warmth and there's brightness and they're able to kind of see the uniqueness of people and really help them feel seen and loved and appreciated. So if you're working with this in your daily life and you're feeling that kind of like fire, ask yourself, what's a way that I can make sure that this warmth stays in the wisdom of analysis and doesn't revert back to attachment. So how can I use this brightness of fire to see things clearly and to create warmth and coziness and kind of a hospitable environment for all sentient beings? So then we have uh, the wisdom of equality of Ratnasambhava, sometimes called um, the wisdom of equanimity. And this sees the universe as one taste in emptiness. And the associated element is earth. And it purifies pride. 
so distorted earth is like you know an earthquake and it crumples up and there creates peaks and valleys and all of these levels and that's what pride does it puts people on all different levels and puts yourself at the very top yeah the earth has become all crumpled and distorted and you know unharmonious and when you're at the top of the mountain with your pride you're also all alone no one is good enough to be your friend if somebody who is lower than you is your friend you're like embarrassed about it um it feels like you can't ask questions because you should already know better so you're trying to preserve your reputation all the time when you have pride you also have all of this like fear of being found out this feeling of i'm not good enough is often just pride it feels like depression or something sometimes but really it's your pride being afraid to be found out. So pride, when it's kind of in this elemental quality of positioning yourself so far above everyone else, you have to realize that the way you see yourself under the influence of pride is not how you exist. What pride does is it takes all of your best qualities on your best day, when nothing was wrong, when nothing was stressful, and it says, this is how you are, this is who you are. You on your best day, your best qualities, and then slightly exaggerated. And you identify as that version, but you've never been that version except for on one magical day 10 years ago or something, or maybe not even then. And so there's all this pressure to perform at that level of you on your best day or how you see yourself at your best. There's this pressure to stay on that mountaintop, but it's doomed to failure because you don't have all those conditions together yet. So you're forever disappointed in yourself or defensive about yourself. And it's just this horrible place of isolation and defensiveness. So if you're remembering the way that kind of like keeps you trapped above and keeps you sort of feeling paranoid and threatened, then it can make you want to switch to what is the healthy version? What's the more enlightened version? And that's that wisdom of equanimity, which makes the earth kind of flat. And we're not saying that there's like a problem with flatness or a problem with mountains. We're not getting like that. We're just saying, think of it internally as an elemental experience of earth, okay? So if everything is flat, then you see everybody's equality, the way that they all want happiness, they don't want suffering, the way they all have Buddha nature, the way they all have innate ignorance, and everything else is just variations of that. But we're all the same in that way. And some people are closer to enlightenment, some people are further away from enlightenment, but that's not hierarchy, it's just conditions have come together for that. So when you're having this wisdom of equality, you get that beautiful sense of the human experience, the universal human experience and feeling connected to everybody. You don't feel suspicious or alienated or too different. You feel that sameness in the correct way, which doesn't mean you don't have surface uniqueness and stuff, it's all good, but you're really able to connect with the universal human experience in a deep way. And without pride, it's so much easier to be generous, to be abundant, not to be miserly, all of those things. So then we have the wisdom of achieving activities of Amoga City. Sometimes it's called swift wisdom or the wisdom of accomplishment. So same meaning, just alternative translations. And this is that spontaneous wisdom that works for the welfare of all. It's swift, it's quick, it jumps to the aid, it's efficient, it moves swiftly. And the associated element is air or wind. And it purifies jealousy. So again, coming elemental to it. So think about how when you're anxious, the energy system in your body is very agitated, moves really, really quickly. Think about how when you're really, really tired and lethargic, the wind energy kind of feels Ugh. And then think about afflictions tied to wind energy. Okay, jealousy, what does it do? Je jealousy moves back and forth between me and you, you who I'm jealous of. 
you who have more than me, who have more respect than me, who have more resources than me, who have more happiness than me, who have more beauty or wealth, whatever, whatever, education, whatever, whatever you get jealous about, jealousy is moving back and forth with this comparison. There's a lot of movement. And with that movement, there's not stability when it's in that distorted form, but it's quick. It's like, you have this, I have that. You have this, I have that. And it's just bing, 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 you know, back and forth and back and forth. When it's purified and when that energy then accompanies the wisdom of achieving activities, you become like Tara. You jump to the aid of sentient beings. So of course, Tara belongs to the Amitabha Buddha family, but green Tara is green related to this air swift wisdom that spontaneously works for the welfare of all. So think of her foot out, ready to leap to the aid of sentient beings. So that kind of efficiency that compares in the right way, that knows what needs to be done, that just acts, that's the wisdom that we get when we purify jealousy. And in daily life, we can kind of start to harness that moving comparison energy and ask ourselves, can we be more in alignment with swift wisdom? And then the last one is the Dharmatattu wisdom of Virachana. And this Dharmadhatu wisdom is sometimes called all-encompassing wisdom or the wisdom of the nature of phenomena or all-performing wisdom or absolute wisdom or the wisdom of voidness. They all mean the same thing, but there's a lot of translation variations for this one for whatever reason. And this is that bare, non-conceptualizing awareness, spacious, not spacey, right? Relaxed, not vague, focused, not stressed, open. It's that open spacious awareness that is very, very accommodating, very flexible, can hold many things at once. And it's related to the element of space. And that drop is um, what represents it. It's a dissolving drop like the top of a womb, right? So like that. And it purifies ignorance. So if you're thinking about ignorance, if you're really being dominated by more than just the innate ignorance, you've got really manifest afflicted ignorance happening as your kind of default mode. What you are is kind of spacey and vague and disassociated and just not connected to the present moment in a very kind of loose way. So you might be kind of a benign, nice person, but you, somehow it's like people can't really connect with you because you're not really there. And when you're by yourself, you can't really connect with anything because you're not really there. You're just kind of spaced out all the time. So in its afflicted aspect, it's very hard to learn new things. It's hard to remember things. It's hard to get any tasks accomplished. And I think that we all fall into this mode fairly easily when we're alone for long periods of time. You know, you like walk into a room in order to do something, you start doing it. And then halfway through, you just kind of vaguely stop and move on to something else. You read a couple pages of a book, put it down, start dinner, forget about it. You know, you can get kind of just spacey. But the purified aspect is so powerful if we can start to connect with that and to invite that. Because the purified aspect is the mind that is able to understand many layers of things and hold many truths at once. Yeah, you're, you're sort of, you're not analytical so much as just open. Yeah, it's kind of the essence of open-mindedness, but in this very powerful way that is vivid and wise, not just kind of like goes with the flow in a kind of hippy-dippy way. Yeah, it's really spacious. So that's this one. So these five Buddha families, um, there's father and mother aspects represent the manifestation of all Buddha's purified psychophysical aggregates, our environment, 
and the cosmos. So being related to elements is not accidental. We created this universe from our minds and then this universe has an influence on it and it goes back and forth and it's a little bit chicken or the egg, but we can start to come in control with even the elements of the earth by coming into control with the elements of our body and the way they're associated with the minds that accompany them. And so there's a female aspect of all of these, the five wisdom mothers, some names will vary, but you have Vajravarahi, Lachana, Mamaki, Pandaravazini, and Samayatara. Again, the blue and the white are often swapped. And there's those fathers again, blue and the white sometimes swapped. So just to summarize all of this, this is from Kurti Sencha Rinpoche. He says, According to Kurti Sencha Rinpoche, the five types of Buddhas are related to the five delusions. And the cessation of those delusions manifests as the deity. It can also be said that the five impure aggregates, having been purified, manifest as the deities. But here, the particular thing is the delusions. The purity of this mental continuum that is achieved by ceasing anger manifests as the deity Akshobhya. The purity of this mental continuum achieved by the cessation of ignorance manifests as Varachana. The purity of this mental continuum achieved by ceasing pride and miserliness manifests as the deity Ratnasambhava. The purity of this mental continuum achieved by ceasing jealousy manifests as the deity Amogasiddhi. And the purity of this mental continuum that is experienced by ceasing attachment manifests as Amitabha. Of those five, there's probably some that resonate more than others. Some that you're like, oh, that's me. And some that you're like, huh, I don't really relate to that. We all have all five, both afflicted aspects and sort of gradually developing wisdom aspects, but different ones will take turns having prominence. And all practices help with all five, but all practices emphasize one. So if you remember yesterday when we did the Chen Rezig practice, at certain points there were empowerments within the sadhana where we invite all Buddha family, all five Buddha families and their retinues with Amitabha as their principal. Yeah, and you're like, why is Amitabha the principal? I thought we were doing Chen Rezig. Anyway, I'm going with it. <laughs> but Amitabha as their principal is showing us that Chen Rezig belongs to Amitabha's Buddha family, the Lotus family, meaning that the emphasis of Chen Rezig practice is purifying attachment, developing discriminating awareness, and the others as well. And so if you're looking at the mandala, you're going to have probably a lotus in the middle, like that. So some of you know this teaching, um, and some of you are new to it. Um, do you have thoughts or questions about it? Um, what's the function or... Um... Uh, why is the, the aspect of the female and the mother? Is it to do with father or mother tantra when you said about the five female? No, that's um, all, all tantras have father mother aspect. Yeah, so it's not related to father tantra or mother tantra. Um, and father tantra and mother tantra are not referring to whether the deity is male or female, right? Because Haruka is a male deity, but it's mother tantra, for example. So, um, yeah, there were, there's associations that seem like would be obvious, but are actually not the case. So like all things in Tantra, you're trying to balance method and wisdom and integrate and unite method and wisdom. So the female aspect always represents wisdom. The male aspect always represents method. And both aspects are within ourselves as an individual and need to be balanced and united. Yeah. So you know, whether it's an elemental quality or somehow a gendered quality or a practice quality, what we're wanting is integration. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question because you think, what? <laughs> yeah, Claire, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if there is a book or anything that would show us what you just told us. It just seems to be so correct and just almost, almost mind-blowing to think of how it all slots together. 
Um, and it's just like, how do I remember all of that? My, my go-to is the Five Buddha Families chapter in Chugyam Trimpa's book, Journey Without Goal. Yeah, okay. Journey Without Goal. It's just one chapter, it's beautiful. Um, there's kind of a, oh, I don't know. Sometimes I recommend this book, sometimes I don't, on using the Five Buddha Families in daily life. For super, super duper Buddhists, it might be a little bit too light, but I, I find it really interesting. So some of you might like it. It's, um, it's by Irini Rockwell. Yes, it's called The Five Wisdom Energies by Irini Rockwell. Um, there's also a good one by Rob Priest. It's called uh, The Mandala and Visions of Wholeness. And it's got a little bit of Jungian interestingness if you're a Jungian person, but it also talks about the five Buddha families in an interesting way as does that uh, book by Geshe Tashi Sering called Tantra, has a nice chapter on it too. So, so you'll find it peppered around. And um, Lama Sultram Alion um, also talks about it, I think in like Dakini Wisdom or something like that. And she has some good YouTube videos about the five Buddha families. Um, and she speaks about it really eloquently. So yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? And I think it helps us also relate to other people differently. You know, if we think, oh, you're always like that. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, wait, you're always like that. Oh, oh, you're always like that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. And then you think, okay, well, how can I invite the enlightened aspect? I'm not trying to change them. I'm trying to flip the switch to the other version of them. You know, oh, I don't have to change them. In fact, I can't change them. In fact, that has all been a fruitless exercise. What I can do is try to speak to their wisdom and bring that out yeah and so then it becomes less of this kind of inner turmoil of that is so exasperating you think yes which is the flip side of their amazing quality which is why they're my friend in the first place because it's such a cool thing to be around it's just they're not perfect <laughs> darn it wait neither am i yeah so it's it's interesting hey see you after lunch <laughs>